Competitive Pokemon has a rough track record when it comes to team creativity. Now, this isn't entirely earned, as to be completely honest, this is mainly how it comes off to an outsider looking in. With enough experience playing in the competitive circuit, you'll come to learn that at a local, regional, or even national level, players will gravitate towards some off-meta picks to lend them advantages in certain situations. Take for example the Jump Love team that Joseph Ugarte used to win the Portland Regional Championships in 2023. This may have been an established team created by Justin Knox and Santino Tarquinio, but no one really expected a jump bluff to win a major anytime soon. Joe proved that a smart and talented player can take an off-meta Mon to success even at a high level. But the vast majority of people complaining about not being able to use their favorites likely aren't aiming to compete at a regional championship, but rather on the competitive ladder from the comfort of their homes. The common sentiment is that competitive Pokemon isn't the type of game where you can use your favorites to win, and that Karen quote people misuse from Gen 2 only helps to perpetuate the idea that a good game would allow someone to do this all the time. I've been playing this game for nearly 10 years now, and I couldn't disagree more. From my experience, I've been able to make even the worst Pokemon work at the very least on the competitive ladder. And I'm not talking about your Generation 8 side target weakness policy stuff. I mean like a real team that I wouldn't mind taking to a local event. So I set off to prove this to the masses by attempting to take my favorite Pokemon of all time, Honchkrow, to top 500 on Master Ball on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. This is how that went. If you enjoyed this video and I am playing on time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe because I make tons of competitive Pokemon content just like this. As a matter of fact, you should sub right now because I have a playlist full of videos that I know you'll enjoy that you can watch right after this one. Also, sponsor time. This channel is partnered with Gamersups. If you want to support my work and get great tasting drinks, you can order Gamersups through my link in the description down below or with code MOXIEBOOSTER at checkout for 10% off. Gamersups is a caffeinated product that I recommend only to my 18 plus viewers, but my link will send you to their caffeine free product section just in case. Every product purchased through my link supports my channel financially, so I'd really appreciate the support. Now back to the video. So for this challenge, I set the following rules. I have to start from a fresh account that has never touched the rank ladder. This is to emulate the experience that the average newcomer would have in attempting to use their favorite unranked. Beyond that, I don't think it's really a challenge to hit top 500 from an account that was already in Master Ball or in Great Ball 9 from the ladder reset at the start of a season. Typically, when someone wants to take a low tier Pokemon to number 1 for content, they'll camp out the competitive ladder and wait for the reset at the start of each month, then grab some games when there's hardly anyone online or in Master Ball to try to snipe that number 1 slot. This drastically reduces the challenge, as you may imagine. So I decided to wait a few days after the ladder reset to ensure that this would be the sort of difficulty the average player could expect. I also had to stream the entire challenge so no one could accuse me of boosting my account with the standard team instead of running Honchkrow. With these rules explained, let's talk strategy. Now, Honchkrow isn't exactly the pinnacle of competitive viability in Pokemon, which is ironic because Murkrow dominated the first format of Gen 9 VGC due to its ability Prankster letting it set Tailwind up with priority. Unfortunately, upon evolving, Murkrow trades nearly all utility it has for better offensive stats and mildly better bulk while also losing out on some speed. Sure, it hits harder, but it's not enough to justify running it over any other dark type attacker, especially in a generation with the likes of Chen Pao or King Gambit. Its ability also changes to Moxie, the namesake of this channel. You can see why it's my favorite Pokemon. I, I just, I like the Pokemon. This isn't even in the script. I just think Hauntra is really cool. It has like a little witch's broom for a tail, and he also has that stupid hat. And in Pokemon Stadium or whatever that game was, Pokemon Battle Revolution, he would tip his hat like a Redditor. That, that was cool. I like that. I think he, I think he's kind of cute. Anyways, this ability would allow for Honchkrow to get a boost to its attack every time it scores a KO, allowing it to snowball. Now, if we were playing singles, I'd definitely go with this, as you can just use a Choice Scarf on one of these dudes and call it a day. But in doubles, due to things having Fake Out, Redirection, and Protect, it's a lot harder to pull off a Moxie Sweep. I ended up settling on a critical hit set utilizing its ability Super Luck. Super Luck raises a Pokemon's crit chance by one stage. The way that crits are calculated in Pokemon are such that at plus one, there's a 12.5% chance to crit, at plus two, it's a 50% chance, and at plus three, it's just a guaranteed critical hit. I decided to run Razor Claw's Honchkrow's item to raise its crit chance on all of its moves to 50% after Super Luck, and gave it Night Slash as its main dark move because even though it's only 70 base power, it also has that high crit chance, meaning it's plus three and a guaranteed crit move. This was effectively a 105 base power dark move that could ignore Reflect, Honchkrow's attack drops, or any defense boost the opponent may have. This should be useful against really bulky Pokemon like
like Farigraf, Cresselia, or Dondozo. Effectively, Urshifu at home. Now, I have a philosophy when it comes to team building with an off-meta Pokemon. You can't just attempt to replicate another Pokemon and end up with worse version of it. Luckily, Honchkrow can separate itself from Urshifu by running Tailwind and Dual Wing Beat, the latter of which is our best option into opposing fighting types or grass Pokemon like Amoongus. I decided to run Dual Wing Beat over Brave Bird for two reasons. First off, the recoil Honchkrow takes will ruin a lot of our defensive calcs if we were to run Brave Bird, and Dual Wing Beat hitting twice means that we'll bypass Focus Sash and Sturdy as well as have an average of 100 base power on the move since we hit twice and have a 50% chance to crit, but it can go as high as 120 if we end up critting twice. AD is passable for the occasions we fail to crit as well. The only real drawback is that chance to miss, which is definitely going to come into play in a couple of games. Moving on to our build, we really have to take advantage of what little bull Conchgro has since it's not going to be outspeeding anything naturally. Really, its only good stats are its HP and attack. I ended up settling on this EV spread. I focus mainly on defensive calcs to make it easier for Honchkro to reliably get off two moves each game, the first of which would either be Night Slash, Dual Wing Beat, or Tailwind to allow its partners to outspeed opposing Pokemon. The next would likely be Sucker Punch since in a lot of situations, Honchkrow will still end up getting outsped. Unfortunate, I know, but it's the world we live in. The physical bulk will allow for Honchkrow to always live a Mystic Water Surging Strikes from an Adamant Urshifu and live it from Terra Water Scarf Urshifu 94% of the time. This also will always live an Icicle Crash from Sword of Ruin Adamant Chen Pao after an Intimidate and has an 88% chance to live if Chen Pao ends up being Adamant. Honestly, See, once you've confirmed you can live these sorts of attacks, you're pretty much set on physical bulk. The speed stat it hits is 103, meaning that after Tailwind, this Honchkrow should outspeed Timid Max Speed Fluttermane unless they get any speed boost from Protosynthesis or Booster Energy. Finally, the attack is just dumped to hit the bump at 116 Adamant. Since I'm running Terra Dark, this means we'll almost always one-shot bulky Fluttermane with a critical hit, and we won't even need it to crit once we pair it with its best partner on the team. Chen Pao Sword of Ruin will allow for Honchkrow's Terra Dark moves to effectively serve as nukes against the bulkiest Pokemon in the format with Terra Dark Crit Night Slash becoming a clean 2-hit KO against Dondozos, and Dual Wing Beat being a 2-hit KO against Iron Hands if we manage to get both crits each time. Chan Pao is running a pretty standard set, being a simple max speed, max attack, 4 HP Focus Sash set with Sucker Punch, Ice Go Crash, Sacred Sword, and Protect. The next partner on this team will be a Hisuian Arcanine. It's one of the strongest Intimidators in the format, where this team will be using a Choice Band Terra Normal set. Assault Vest Rillaboom functions as a decent check to the likes of problem Pokemon like Fluttermane or Urshifu Rapid Strike, it also allows for us to override Psychic Terrain with Grassy Terrain and lets Honchkrow or Chen Pao go for Sucker Punches on Psy Spam Pokemon like Armourouge or Indeedy. Of course, we need our own Urshifu to contend with the strongest teams in the format. Since our Tailwind isn't super reliable, I ended up opting for a full speed and attack set with a Jolly Nature and a Choice Scarf. So on leads against Hyper Offense teams, Urshifu can take out whatever threatens the Honchkrow with Terra Water Surging Strikes, allowing for it to set up a Tailwind or go for an attack. Our final team member will be Golden Go. This bulky Steel Ghost type allows for our team to have a better matchup into various fairy types or terra fairy Pokemon that we may see on ladder, which is definitely necessary for taking full advantage of Tailwind and recovery from Rillaboom's grassy terrain while making sure our three fairy weak offensive mons have a defensive switch that we can go into. With the team set, I began my quest for top 500 with my favorite Pokemon of all time, and since I'm an experienced VGC player, I should be able to make it through beginner one without any issues whatsoever. So, I lost my first game. All the way down in beginner one. We'll pretend that didn't happen. In my defense, I, the best Pokemon players tend to ladder down there. Regionals, no. International championships, this is where the real pros knock heads. I suppose the loss is fine though, since, you know, you can't go lower than rock bottom. The next battle went much better as I paired into a pretty strange looking Trick Room team with Sableye, Farigraph, and Oranguru. Normally, Sableye would be an issue for this sort of team, since Prankster Will-O-Wisp can just shut down most physical attackers with a burn, but Honchkrow is a dark type, so its Prankster immunity meant that this is a game where it could really spread its wings. And by that, I mean Honchkrow took literally every KO and nothing on our team took any damage. To be fair, the matchup in Honchkrow was pretty unwinnable for them, but they should have prepped for the bird. And as luck would have it, my very next game would be into Psy Spam, my least favorite archetype to play against, but I was more than prepared this time around. And when I say I hate this archetype, I mean I like really hate it. I was so prepared for this team that I even got like a little bit too excited. Kill! Yeah, I won again without losing a single Pokemon. Am I effectively just smurfing and playing very clearly newer players to farm clips for my video? Yes, but it's all part of the process, baby. Honestly though, if I went through every single one of my matches from beginner tier, we'd be here all day, and I don't think they were terribly interesting. Like I said, this is literally a tier for beginners, so we'll fast forward a bit towards the point in the ladder where you'll likely be playing people who have been in Master Ball, but just didn't play long enough to end up in a lower tier after a few seasons. So, let's do a quick compilation of these matches until then.
And just like that, I managed to take Honchkrow to Great Ball Tier completely undefeated. Yep, no losses whatsoever. We'll pretend that didn't happen. You can expect to play some better players from time to time in Great Ball Tier, completely due to the fact that every season all players get reset to Great Ball 9. So, since we're only a few days into the season, some of these players are likely Master Ball regulars. For our first match in this tier, we face off against Draco, who has one of the first standard looking teams I've seen since I began this challenge. With Tornadus, Iron Hands, Ogre Pond, Wellspring, Fluttermane, Urshifu, and Landorus on their team, I actually had to think about my lead a bit more here. I opted into leading off with my Rillaboom and my Golden Go, since on lead, Rillaboom's Fake Out could allow for Golden Go to set up a nasty plot and begin dealing major damage with Make It Rain. In the back, I brought Honchkrow and Chenpao. This is because in endgame situations where most of the other team has been a bit softened up, the double Sucker Punch can pretty effectively clean up the board. But the real question is, can Honchkrow game in this matchup? I think Honchkrow can game. I think Honchkrow can game. With a lead of Tornadus and Booster Speed Fluttermane, I could tell that a Tailwind would allow for this Fluttermane to cause me issues down the road and prevent my speed control from allowing me to take things out on this team, since Fluttermane would just outspeed and KO my two Dark types anyways. However, Golden Go isn't safe on this lead either as Flutter can threaten it with a Shadow Ball. So I opted to go for Grassy Glide into the Flutter and Terra Dragon make it rain to try to knock out this Flutter main right away. Terra Dragon may make Golden Go weak to fairy moves, but on this turn one, it should allow me to take reduced damage from Shadow Ball. I got the play right, and despite a double speed drop from Tornadus' Bleak Wind, I took out Flutter main and knocked Tornadus within range of a priority move. My opponent sent in their Urshifu, and from this position, I decided preventing a late game Tailwind was paramount to securing a win condition with Chen Pao. So I swapped in my Chen Pao for Sword of Ruin to activate and hopefully KO this Tornadus. My opponent ends up switching out Tornadus for Landorus and protecting the Urshifu. Despite this swap, I get some pretty decent damage off and feel comfortable doubling into the Landorus next turn with Sucker Punch and Grassy Glide, since most Landers this format will run the Choice Scarf item, meaning Protect probably isn't an option for it. My opponent calls this and doubles right back out into the Tornadus, which just barely hangs on. At that point, their Urshifu takes out my Rillaboom with a close combat. From this position, I'm able to get my Honchkrow in, who should be able to tank a hit from the Urshifu normally if it weren't for my own Chen Pao. But I need to keep this thing on the field to secure a KO on Urshifu with dual wing beat. I decide to lock in this gamble, and it works out for me as the opponent goes for Tailwind and close combats my Sash Chen Pao, letting me take two KOs and locking down the Landers with double Sucker Punch, securing the game. For my next game, I notice that the opponent only has one rock resist, and I decide to lean heavily into that. I lead Honchko with Arcanine, hoping to get off Tailwind and just start spamming my rock slides. In the back, I'm packing Golden Go for Tailwind Make It Rain, and Chen Pao because more damage isn't ever really a bad thing. The only thing is I really need to get rid of Urshifu right now, as my team is pretty weak to Wicked Blow. So I actually opt to go for Dual Wing Beat into the Urshifu, hoping to remove it as soon as possible. And Golden Go can come in for Arcanine and be immune to either a Close Combat or Spore. The play works out perfectly as I make the trade of my Honchkrow being asleep for a KO on the Bear. With my opponent spending their Terra on the Amoongus and Ogre Pond hitting the field, I know I can safely swap in Arcanine for Honchkrow, Intimidate, and then start spamming the best move in the game. They got sick of this pretty quick and forfeited the match soon after, recognizing the wall that Terra Dragon Golden Go would be for them at that point. We'll skip over my next match as it wasn't Terra interesting and a really positive matchup for me, but the match right after that, I was definitely put into my place. The short version of it is, I realize just how weak my team is to Chi Yu when I don't have the right Terra for the job, and despite my Honchkrow picking up a KO, I got endgamed by a speed boosting Flutter in the sun, meaning Scarf Urshifu couldn't secure a KO due to the sun reducing the water damage, and the Iron Hands right next to it was giving me that wild charge stare when I hit the Flutter main with that dollar store surging strikes. This was my first real loss. We're not counting the unspeakable game from the start of the challenge. Despite this minor setback, I was able to recover pretty quickly and climb to Ultra Ball before the end of my first stream. I even ran into a viewer of mine who ran a Swall out of all Pokemon. It was a pretty cool set, and it made me happy to know that there were other people on the ladder trying to get their favorites to function. I think this person's in chat. Hey, get out of here. I know you- I see your name on screen right now. Get out of here. You better close the stream right now. I ended up wrapping up my first day of the challenge with a record of 14 wins and 2 losses. One, if you're being nice to me. And we are now at the start of Ultra Ball Tier. From this point on, it would be impossible to fall into Great Ball Tier again, and we're knocking on the door of Master Ball, where we'll find out just where the game puts us in the ladder once we wrap up in Ultra. I played a few games, went undefeated, and that's when it happened. Keep in mind, we climbed- I don't know how this game tracks ELO when you're coming from, like, lower tiers, but we climbed from Master- or from Beginner to Master Ball with only two losses, one of them in Pokeball, or one of them in Beginner and the other one in Great. All right, five, four, three two, one. 
290 we're top 300 already that's like three games we gotta win like three games. I hit rank 299 in Master Ball tier, putting me above my goal of top 500 immediately and into top 300 territory. But I didn't like just how easy this ended up being, especially when I'm content pilled. At this point, I made a mistake. I decided to push for top 100 with Honchkrow and thought that would be a good idea. It wasn't. We were already at the goal of top 500. How much worse could it be? This is pretty much where I realized something about Gen 9 VGC. So let's take a brief detour so I can explain right away the moral of the story in very clear words. Gen 9 was not made to be played in closed team sheets best of one. Pokemon is a game with a ton of factors outside the player's control that can determine the outcome of game. Paralysis, flinch, sleep, freeze, missing a move, disconnecting from games, you get my point. If you've played Pokemon even casually, you know that these things can ruin a battle for you, even if you're mostly playing well. Gen 9 adds another layer of unknown to this equation, as this gen introduced Terastalizing, a gimmick with practically limitless uses and applicable strategies. This could be used defensively to prevent a Pokemon from getting knocked out, like I used with my Terra Ghost Chen Pao, or it can be used offensively to boost the damage output of a Pokemon, like my Terra Dark Honchkrow. Since any Pokemon, except Ogrepan, can become any type, there's so much up in the air that it can feel really out of your control if you lose a match to a random Terra. Take this clip for example of me stating the worst possible outcome of a Terra, believing no one would ever use it because it's useless, then immediately finding out that I was right, recovering from the bad turn, and then losing to the player anyways off of a bullet punch crit. We already took a hit, so we're at 100 base power. We're gonna be at 150. That Garchomp's not living. If he was Terra, if I knew what his Terra was, I would go for Drain Punch, but I'm fairly certain it's ground. Like, if it was Terra Steel, I would Drain Punch, but like, I'm pretty sure it's ground. Watch it be Terra Normal, and I just get like walled out. No. Alright, Terra Ground, you're just gonna Earthquake? <laughs> Why? I was joking! That isn't even a set! Maybe they pounce? That'd be dumb, though. What if they swords danced? Close combat. That did hurt. Now they have to crit this one. Uh, okay. Drain Punch. Don't, don't crit me. If tournaments were best of one close team sheets, this format would be a nightmare. It's for that reason we play best of three to minimize RNG playing a factor, and in 2023, VGC adopted the open team sheets rule set, meaning that both players would be able to see every detail of the opposing team short of their EV spreads. This rule set not only drastically improved the accessibility of the game, making it much easier to learn, but also rewards the more skilled player who can identify their and their opponent's win condition and play appropriately. Unfortunately, this only applies to tournaments and not to the online ladder. Even though it'd be so easy to make that info available at the start of a match, just like pressing the plus button should bring up the opposing team's rental screen or something, I don't know, I don't work for Game Freak. But yeah, it was here at the high end of the ladder that I began to lose my patience with the game. Usually I wouldn't mind the roller coaster of games I was about to endure, because that's part of the fun of the online ladder, but I was reminded of just why I prefer tournaments to this. So here's a brief compilation of my rubber banding on the ladder trying to reach top 100. <laughs> At some points, I got so close to my stretch goal of top 100 that I could almost taste it, but it was almost always ripped away by me leading poorly, an unexpected Terra, RNG, or me just not playing well. The sorts of things that I'm used to recovering from in a tournament. This all culminated to my final game of the challenge, the one that broke me. After rubber banding all the way back to the 600s, I ended up facing off against a Tyranitar Sneasler team. I could tell that I would be able to beat it with a pretty positive matchup into it, but Sneasler had me a bit worried. It's pretty much the epitome of an RNG Pokemon. It's known for just a couple of sets, one of which being Unburdened Terra Rock Rock Slide and Dire Claw. A fast, powerful Rock Slide with the potential to flinch is terrifying enough in endgames, but Dire Claw was my real concern. That move has a 50% chance to inflict a status condition. If it gets the 50%, you can either be poisoned, paralyzed, or worst of all, put to sleep. I went into this match very weary of that.
All seemed to be going fine, as leading off Terra Dragon Golden Go into Heatran and Rillaboom basically guaranteed I'd be able to set up on them and begin trying to pick up KOs. It certainly wasn't an easy match, but I eventually managed to get into an endgame position where a weakened Sneasler and Tyranitar would have to endure a make it rain at plus one special attack to win. With my Urshifu locked into Scarf Surging Strikes, I knew almost no defensive Terra could allow for Tyranitar to live the double up. They revealed Terra Grass, allowing them to resist Surging Strikes, but now forfeiting their special defense boost from the sand. I was pretty certain that there was no way they could possibly win the game, and I was wrong. Dire Claw targets into my Golden Go, now being able to hit it because I dropped my Steel type for Dragon at the beginning of the game. This landed massive damage off of a critical hit, and worst of all, put Golden Go to sleep. This is notably the only way to sleep a Golden Go in VGC since Relic Song doesn't exist, and Good as Gold doesn't allow for it to be yawned, sleep powdered, hypnosis, etc. Yeah, you could use Weezing to turn off Good as Gold, but that's getting pedantic. My point is, Jinichi Masuda hates my guts. I lose the game and decide to throw in the towel on the stretch goal, at least somewhat satisfied that we did reach top 500. So what's the verdict? Can you win with your favorites? I'd say yes. Honchkur was frankly an awful competitive Pokemon, but with enough patience in the team builder and skill at executing your game plan, you can make practically any Pokemon work in VGC, at the very least on the online ladder. But it's not terribly hard to do well with a bad Pokemon even at local tournaments. Trust me, I know, this is my hobby. If you can identify what niche that Pokemon fills and give it strong enough partners to allow for the Pokemon to fulfill its role on the team as effectively as possible, you can win with your favorites. Maybe not at a regional though, I don't know. If you enjoyed this video or learned anything new, be sure to leave a like and subscribe because I make tons of videos discussing competitive Pokemon. This was a bit of a differently formatted video, but I hope you all enjoyed because I want to experiment with more challenges. Go ahead and leave a suggestion for a challenge in the comments while you're down there. You'll also be seeing a playlist in the end card of this video with more videos from me that I'd love for you to check out. Thanks to all my YouTube members and Patreon supporters for supporting the channel. If you want bonus content every week and to see your name at the end of my videos, be sure to click the join button below or visit my Patreon page which is linked in the description. And a special thanks to my most boosted supporters, Avatar67, Kanor, Joseph B, Narwiz, and Pokemace for their generous pledges. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!